Okay, Craig, so we're here after a delicious meal at the TAM. And you're, what are you holding here? Well, this is uh, one of the, uh, I used to know the number, I don't know anymore. Uh, maybe t 12 of the uh, heads for the costume of the minions, so-called. That's actually a word out of the dictionary, but it's become a proper name for these little de demonic guys from the movie The Gate which uh, I went up with uh, Randy Cook uh, to uh, the Toronto area to work on in 1986. Came out in 1987. Our two little kids, two little boys, and, and, their old, and the older sister one fought off all the demons of hell. So uh, we got uh, some reasonably short people who are all around five and a half foot tall and uh, put them in costumes and put heads of the same exact head on them because it wasn't necessary to make them look different. Uh, they were all supposed to be the same sort of weird little squiddy creature. And uh, because of our budget, because of our time frame, uh, every shortcut I could think of that wouldn't subtract, uh, you know, uh, substantially from the end product, I took it. And so this head, as well as its brethren, uh, with the exception of one, which was sort of the hero, which had an ability to do very minor little twitches and movements with its, uh, I think it blinked and did a little movement with its mouth. The rest of them didn't do anything. So uh, the sort of vacant, but vaguely uh, malicious look of them was sufficient to you know, make them look like something you didn't really want to be around. <laughs> uh, Randy, in, in the case of the Minions, uh, had done a sketch of one of them, uh, unconsciously incorporating a goodly amount of Ray Harryhausen with the three-fingered hands and the big chest. To me, it looked like the Cyclops, but without the hairy legs and a different head. But the head had a different look, and uh, he has since said that he, uh, he was inspired by the producer, John Kennedy, that it was a uh, kind of a... Uh, you know, a, a, what do you call it, an inside joke that was kind of a uh, caricature of John. I don't know if that's uh, particularly kind, but it's not <laughs> too far off. So uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the minions. He's a little dusty, and he's certainly not any the better for age any more than I am, but uh, he's in reasonably good shape. He's, his dentures are uh, slipping here. These were once fixed in place, but they've managed to come loose, so he's looking a little bit uh, uh, dishabillé here. But uh, I uh, sculpted the original teeth and then made these hard acrylic uh, copies for some of them. On other ones, we made a, just a quick a soft uh, urethane set of teeth. So it, it's, it's somewhat varied depending upon uh, which ones would be put in the front row, which ones would be put, you, you get the point, you know, with uh, the, uh, the most rapidly made ones with the least uh, uh, convincing materials we tried to route to the back, but I think it all got mixed up. So they have sort of plastic shell eyes, and uh, I devised a paint scheme that I personally could quickly uh, follow for all of the heads, and I just put them through like uh, an assembly line. I painted them myself. And the scheme was based on something I had kind of uh, established for myself when I worked on the famous movie E.T., which was I had seen the work of an artist named Chuck Close. And Close, or Close, I really don't know how to pronounce his name, I've only seen it written, had an interesting technique where he emulated the technique of color lithography where he would actually do a complete pass in a particular uh, single color, like say magenta, and then he would do a yellow, and then he would do a blue. And I thought, you know, if he can make that work so well for his artwork, which were enormous, by the way, huge portraits of people, very unsettling in their realism. I thought, I'm gonna try and take a swing at that, and I actually did that for E.T., and I liked it. It, it gave me a certain uh, transparency, and uh, it also, eliminated the, uh, the need to make very, very specific colors. And uh, I knew from conversation with Randy that he basically wanted these flesh-like, flesh-like in the sense of Caucasian, human, but uh, kind of pale and spotty and unpleasant. And so uh, you know, that was enough to go on. So we have little elements of blue that are kind of pushing through the basic, uh, you know, the pale 
kind of uh, sallow look. And it worked well. And uh, I used the same technique for the bodies where I could just basically tell these guys who weren't, they thought they were, but believe me, they weren't skilled painters. And I just had them lay in kind of echoing the structure of the body uh, in a blue pass and a red pass and in a, a finally a kind of a cream yellow pass. So, uh, and they were painted with a kind of a urethane paint. It's held up pretty well. I mean, that's, what are we, about 30, 32 years ago, I guess, since that was out. And we both looked just the same. <laughs> Not. <laughs> so there was a lot of uh, forced perspective yeah. work in the gate. Yeah. Did you, were, did you have any part in that? Or I were did. you I didn't a have any witness? Part of it. Yeah. yeah, I was there for all of that filming. Uh, as far as, however, if the question is aimed at uh, like the conception of it or the blocking of it, no, that was all handled by Randy. And uh, he was borrowing a page from Peter Ellenshaw and his work on a Disney film called uh, Darby McGill and the Little People, primarily, where you had uh, actors dressed as leprechauns, not only dressed, but makeup, you know, the hair and all that. And uh, where they were placed far back in the set and then the uh, one person, the actor playing Darby, an old fellow that just a accidentally falls in a well and finds himself in a kingdom of leprechauns, uh, he, st he, he was simply st uh, stationed closer to the camera, and because the camera has one eye, which uh, has difficulty seeing depth, absolutely no ability to see depth, uh, that all comes from having stereoscopic vision, two eyes. So the camera has one eye, so my hand up here, going after this head, if I put it up close enough, is a giant hand reaching for this head. Back here, it's a little hand. So that's the whole principle right there. Sounds simple, but it becomes complicated when you have to put them in an environment. And that's where uh, Randy came up with some clever, clever composites, but I really have to hand it to the late uh, William Beaton, who was a Canadian art director and architect, who worked out the mathematics in a more particular, precise way, along with the set builders there. It's always been my feeling that although Randy had a good borrowed idea from uh, Ellen Shaw uh, and, and understood the generality of having a, like a four to one, that if there wasn't technically someone who could really guarantee that they could translate that properly and paint the sets, the little, the normal sized one up here for the big whatever, and then, and then the duplicate oversized set for the people wearing these costumes, it would have been a fiasco, and uh, the Canadians really uh, distinguished themselves. They did a brilliant job, and uh, so instead of being an embarrassment and a blow-up, it was a great success. And uh, the fun of it was that you could see the composite result uh, the very next day. You know, we see it in dailies. I remember when the early scenes we did were when they were chasing the little girl up the steps, and the door was slammed on them, and uh, I. It, you know, I can't, I, I can't say at this distance that people applauded, but we were highly enthused, let's put it that way. Everybody working on it was tickled to death that it worked and that they could see it right there. So uh, Randy's idea for it, you know, worked out terrifically. And uh, his new wrinkle, as opposed to Darby, was obvious that instead of putting men in costumes to look like funny little pixies or something, you put them in a monster suit and now they're little monsters. And to this day, there are many people who are confused where the stop motion animation is used in the picture and where it isn't. And many of them think that the scenes with the minions are animated and they are not. They're, they're men in suits with, I think, I think no exception in the first film. And I think that's also a compliment to Randy's animation of the big demon that comes out at the end, which was a, a, a small uh, model that he animated so smoothly that it confuses the two worlds, the two techniques, so that they seem to be all of a, the same sort of, uh, you know, magical environment, but uh, were really two quite different techniques. So uh, it was a lot of work, and uh, they didn't have any money nor uh, support for me, so I went up there j basically having shipped up the suits just naked, as it were. In other words, I had no support. And uh, they got, like, volunteer kids to help out, who turned out to be wonderful, wonderful people very hard working, very attentive. They took it all on their shoulders for me, really. Uh, so I was blessed in that. And uh, 
so, I mean, I would obviously uh, supervise, which is basically another word for stand around and say, do this, do that, but I didn't have to as much hands-on get in there. I did. I absolutely did, but I didn't have to do an impossible job by myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had basically males playing the minions, but we had a couple of really, uh, a couple of little living dolls, a couple of little local girls that were in a couple of the costumes, too. I think if some of the boys had seen... Uh, those girls emerged from the suits, they would have been very impressed. As a matter of fact, one of them is the minion that uh, Terry, the character Terry, I think it's his name was. Uh, Lewis Tripp. Louis Tripp. Yeah, Lewis Tripp. Steps on it, and it, it writhes in its little hamsterish agony as it dies. That was actually one of the little gals. Yeah. Speaking of, <clears throat> um, I don't know if it's Lewis or Louis, but... He so he was from St. Catharines. I'm from St. Catharines, and I remember when the gate came out, it was a big deal that a St. Catharines kid was starring in this horror film. I remember him being on the front page of the St. Catharines Standard. Um, what was it like working with with uh, those kids? So there's Stephen Dorff, there was uh, Louis Tripp, there was I, I don't remember the big sister's name, but I remember having a giant crush on her <laughs> as a kid. She's a darling girl, yeah. Uh, I, I'm just because I'm getting to be a, a, a doddering idiot. Uh, <laughs> it'll probably, Krista Denton. Krista Denton mm -hmm. is her name. Uh, hey, good for me, huh? So I haven't completely lost him yet. <clears throat> uh, Louis was, uh, they were all different. Louis uh, was quiet. Um, Krista was charming and just a real, uh, just a real basic sweet girl. She had no airs about her. Good actress, but you know, uh, Mr. Hollywood was uh, you know the other one. Uh, what's his face, uh, Steve? Yeah, he was all over the place. He was he was endearing in a way, but he was he you know too much caffeine or something you know. <laughs> but uh, he was the actor in the bunch. You know, you could see it. And, uh, you know, he's still in the mix to this day. So he, he had that moxie, you know. And I thought he did, by the way. <laughs> a terrific job. I think he really, really... It was important that these kids be able to suspend this film for quite some length of time because adults played little to no role in it. And uh, maybe people don't realize that because they're so darn good. So that's a tribute, I think, to... Uh, to uh, uh, Tibor Takash for uh, finding these kids in the first place. I mean, he did, and he chose them. So uh, it doesn't just happen by accident. And uh, they were all fine to work with. They were as, as cooperative and as sweet and as, as, you know, quick. You know, they mm -hmm. understood immediately what they had to do when they did it. So their eye lines were always consistently good. Their reactions were big enough so that it didn't look like too little or too much for what they were supposed to be seeing. In any mo movie of this nature, uh, it's the triumph of the actor that the audience generally doesn't even consider the fact they weren't looking at these things often. Yeah. Sometimes they were looking at a, a photograph beforehand and told it's about this big and it's gonna be doing that, and then it's on them. So it's like, go ahead, pretend, you know, mm -hmm. convince us. They do it, and they did it. So uh, we were all, you know, very impressed by what, what all of them did. Were there conversations about this being a horror film that was kind of for kids? Because in ways it is, in ways it isn't. It's starring kids. I saw it as a kid. It, it maybe was kind of intense in places. The, the construction worker in the wall was intense. <laughs> Hopefully, for, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it did seem like, you know, some uh, kids could at least grab onto the story of these... I think it's a pertinent question. I think that the the fact that they were kids was uh, obviously germane to the story, but otherwise it was ignored. I think that, uh, I can't speak for Randy, but I know that when I did the work, man, I tried to make him as scary as possible. I tried to make him, you know, something that would uh, startle and scare, uh, you know, a young adult audience, maybe even an older adult audience. I have a prejudice that the further adult you get, the less scared you are by anything. But sometimes you, you, you're surprised. You, you can find yourself reverting to that 10-year-old inside. But, but back to the point that, yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't cut him any slack. <laughs> you know, 
The Workman actually made its own impression. Uh, he kind of revolutionized zombies. Up to that point, they'd been blue. Uh, they'd, they'd looked like they'd had uh, beef stew poured over their heads, or they had worms all over, but they looked like a Halloween mask. And the, uh, I thought, well, first of all, the, it was never called a zombie. It was just a workman. So I thought, well, I'll give him a workman. I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna make this thing look like some strange old guy, you know, but a real human being, but not one you'd want to run into on a dark street, and uh, then go into the dead portion. You know, in other words, I want to start with something that's like, I want to go on the other side of the street from this guy. <laughs> So yeah, so I think if you extrapolate that and look at the whole movie, that was the general attitude. Let's just do a kind of a medium grade horror movie. I mean, it wasn't one of these nerve, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, shattering things like came out of Japan late late in the uh, century and that kind of thing, where they're almost like, uh, you know, maybe you come out of blithering psycho. It was more of a conventional horror film, but but it was very much done in a you know a straightforward manner. Yeah, whenever the element of horror uh, is is employed in the movie, you've got to play that legitimately. Uh, if it's Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Frankenstein had better be halfway threatening. If everybody just you know comes down to a level of uh, I mean, if your monsters are too scaled down and have all the uh, you know, the uh, impact taken out of them so that it'll be okay for the kids. Who wants to see a movie like that? Kids can take a lot. And if they can't, then you wait, but then they will, you know, you shouldn't take them to see it. Uh, these things work themselves out. You know, I was forbidden to see movies by my mother when I was little that later I saw when I was still a kid and they did scare me, but they didn't kill me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's a form of entertainment. It mm -hmm. is. People like to be scared. So you... You get hired to do the monsters for a movie like this, you better try to scare them. What I liked about the Minion characters was more that they were uh, half funny and half uh, creepy. Mm -hmm. uh, you really couldn't, you really couldn't say what you thought about them when you saw them. It said, ew, get them away from me. You know, like, don't put one on me. Were they like undercranked? They, they yeah. seemed to, yeah. Yeah, Randy had the idea that, uh, as with certain small animals, uh, because of perhaps because of their metabolisms, their movements are unpredictably darting, and it's unnerving in a way. If if you make that a really ugly or strange looking thing, that kind of spastic, quick, quick motion adds to the element of like, oh God, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, and another thing it did was immediately take away the sense of, of scale in the bad sense. That, oh, those are just a bunch of guys shambling around in rubber suits. It, it, it gave them a, a, an animus that was different than, than had it been exactly what it was. So uh, it was a good instinct to do that. Uh, interestingly, uh, George Miller had had the same notion for the gremlin on the wing of the aircraft in the movie Twilight Zone, the movie that I had previously worked on. And the problem with that was that I sometimes forgot. I mean, I just forgot in the moment of filming so that when expressions were done and so forth, uh, I sometimes forgot. I'm, I'm, I've hopped over to another movie just to illustrate the difficulties of doing these things. And in the uh, Gremlin thing, I sometimes made the expressions move at normal speed. Well, of course, they got very, almost too much, almost in, uh, inappropriately, to my thinking, too much. Of course, it all goes by so fast. But uh, we didn't have that to worry about in this because they didn't make expressions. So it was just the body movements and then when they all moved as a pack, sort of like rats, it was a helpful thing. You know, uh, when they ran at the girl at the very beginning, when they suddenly materialize out of nowhere in the backyard and race after her, after her that was helpful. When they go up the steps after her, those poor kids, they were all young men. They struggled to get up those steps because the steps, each step was, I think, at least about three and a half feet tall, maybe more. So, I mean, imagine that. And they're half blind wearing these things. So they did their, they really did their heroic best clambering up these steps with these clumsy costumes. So there again, the, the undercranking made it look a little more, not agile particularly, but at least it gave it enough 
speed where they were a threat following her and not. And if you're thinking, well, that made, meant she had to not run away from them too quickly, that's correct. She didn't go up the steps like, ah, ah, ah. it was more like, doop, <laughs> and let the, uh, you know, the film rate take care of that. In fact, Randy uh, went even further in the sequel to The Gate, called The Gate 2, brilliant idea, uh, which, which was to have them, the kids speak as they look at the minion, captured minion, just one minion in that movie, which required that in order to have the minion have the same sort of hyper type movement, that the dialogue for the girl and the boy had to be recorded ahead of time and then played back four times slower. Were a child even a girl sounding like this? Well, it doesn't show because they did such a skillful job, but those kids, uh, Louis Tripp again and uh, Pam Seagal, had to move their lips in sync with that and still make realistic expressions. That's no mean feat. I don't know if I could do it. They did it, both of them, very well. So that when it got sped up, they looked normal, but the little, actually a ballerina wore, wore the costume in that movie. It had the correct, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, scared little mouse quality. So. There, there was one effect. Uh, we can end on this. I won't keep you too much longer, but there was an effect in the first gate that I think people still talk about and are potentially unsure how it was done, and that was the the construction worker or the worker yeah, work fall man. the workman mm -hmm. falling on the ground and breaking up into minions. Yeah. What? what how well, did Randy's, that happen? <laughs> well, Randy's inspiration, I think, was an old uh, Terry tune or something, an old cartoon where uh, Heckle and Jekyll, or maybe, uh, God knows, maybe so. But anyway, somebody, uh, I think, was hit on a mallet on the head, and he broke up into a lot of versions of himself, scrambled around and reassembled into himself again. That's what he told me. So he thought it would be a, uh, a very novel way to have the, uh, the minions suddenly appear and to become a menace to these kids as they had formerly, earlier in the film, menaced uh, their, their little buddy when he fell into the gate itself, down a hole. So he had that idea. And he uh, figured out a way to do it would be to have a figure of the workman. It wasn't the actor himself, for obvious reasons. He couldn't, you know, slant, fall flat in his face. But he had the, uh, the uh, figure uh, on a simple hinge at the feet area so that it would literally hinge forward. Now, what would keep it from just going all the way down? Well, there was a stand, a wooden stand put up that wasn't visible, that he kind of blocked with his body with a kind of a wooden pad on the top that the, the facial part hit. So it, it blocked him so that he fell forward and was stopped by that on the stand. And uh, at the point that it hit like that, uh, they called cut. And uh, I believe the young actors stayed over there. I can't remember. No, no, no. They were added later. They were added at another exposure. That's how it was done. And looking through the camera, uh, they had a kind of a setup where there was a plate of glass where you could sketch. You could accurately sketch where the, uh, the uh, figure of the workman had been so that you could sight through the camera and see that figure outline. And from that point forward, uh, I think Randy up in this raised platform where the camera was set up and the portion of the kid's bedroom that was built to the normal scale, he uh, talked down to an assistant on the floor of the stage where a larger size set that was blended to look the same scale. He had the, the, the boys in the outfits placed uh, as long as it took to fit them into the, the outline. And once he had had them all arranged so that they, they filled in the arms and the whatnots, you know, the legs and the trunk and the head, and he was satisfied they were in the right spot. Then he went down on the floor level and told them the business he wanted them to do. He told them that when he gave them the signal, he wanted this one to jump up and go that way. And this one should come and turn and spin. And they should all sort of run around like disorientated. And then they should all look there and he had a, a, a direction for them all to look where the exposure would be added to the uh, the shot where the two heroes would be the right. brother and sister 
which is how it worked out, and it was timed that way. And so, of course, when we filmed the portion with, uh, who are we talking about? Uh, Steve and uh, Krista, on a little portion of floor, they, they were just a little portion, just big enough for them to stand on, but they were also secured from behind because there was a considerable drop down to the level of the stage, and that had to remain vacant so that you could see, you know, beyond it onto the floor where the little minions were. It, it gets confusing, and, but it was yeah. actually pretty simple when you looked at it from the proper uh, uh, position because the sets were so skillfully painted and lit, they literally did sort of blend together, even to your naked eye, let alone to the camera. And uh, so that the, uh, the full-size five foot six, let's call it, boys who were in those suits way down there now look like little creatures because after all they were on the floor of the bedroom they weren't but they looked like they were and it looked like they were in real time so when you had much 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 closer to camera and higher up so that they looked like they came in the door to their room uh krista and steve they're looking down in their proper position they were actually not seeing any minions they were looking this way and the minions were down under and behind them in a larger portion of the sound stage even when I say it, it sounds a little confusing, but everyone that's seen it can kind of put it together mm -hmm. how it was done. The beauty of it, though, is even though you know how it was done, it still fools you. It's like a good card trick from a great magician. You know, he can tell you what he did, but then if he does it right afterwards, you'll say, well, but, but you said you did this, and he say, I just did it, you know? But, <laughs> you know, in other words, it's the technique, it's the execution as much as the trick is the trick. And that's the case with that particular shot. As far as the missing element from what I've just described would have been the uh, workman becoming these things. Well, he didn't really, they just did a kind of a uh, dissolve through his body, uh, kind of like an accelerated dissolve. A dissolve, of course, is different from a, uh, the dissolve is actually two fades put together. So it, one goes dark and one comes up light. And so it was a tricky thing to do in the camera, but. If indeed it was done in the camera, it's, it actually strikes me, I think it was done in, in an optical effect lab. Illusion Arts, I think, put those pieces together. It's very difficult to do things like that in the camera, like they did in the silent movie days before they had optical effects. And I, I'm pretty certain that they, they simply just did a dissolve on the element of film with the workman figure and sort of slowly dissolved it into the, you know, the right. guys emerging. Uh, happens very quickly, but, you know, as you yourself said, it looks like he's busted up into minions. So Randy's conceit worked, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people got a, a kick out of that. That's, I, I mean... Whether they're frightened or they, la they laugh, it's just not what you expect. Yeah, well, that's that's one of those moments where it feels <laughs> like it's still maintain, maintaining the horror, but it is kind of a kid's, you know, like, like you said, a, a cartoony effect. Yeah. But... Uh, when you talk about people mistaking the minions for stop motion, I would have, I, I'd certainly thought that was a stop motion shot, mm -hmm. but it's, it's an, and an amazing feat. had it been feat. executed as one, you probably would have uh, had, uh, you know, a post-production schedule like a Ray Harryhausen film yeah, of yeah. about a year. Mm -hmm. Now Randy did take a long time mm -hmm. to do far fewer shots than, than Ray ever had to do. God mm -hmm. bless Ray, I mean, I don't know how he did it. He did all this high quality work, tons of things. I don't, I think for an average Ray Harryhausen film, uh, all the animation in the gate is probably would have been uh, half of one of his sequences, you know, in one mm -hmm. of his films like Jason and the Argonauts. But that said, it's very fine quality. It's very well done. And uh, in addition to which, uh, you know, they got their, their special effects all in under a certain ceiling of expenditure, which... Uh, uh, not to compare them again to Ray Harryhausen who did miracles for low budgets but still that kind of idea mm -hmm. where you get a more impressive more <clears throat> expensive look for something that really is still rather economical Yeah, where the missing element is provided with the time and good planning and uh, you know to whatever extent we could good work mm -hmm. now before I let you go I have to ask you this is for film junk there's lots of movie nerds We've I'm done, a movie nerd. Yeah, we've done some uh, episodes about Blu-ray collecting and our, what we call the manifesto, which is how you organize your Blu-rays and so on and so forth. How, do you know how many Blu-rays you have? 
Oh, I know. I've never counted them. I just know they're forcing me out of the house. <laughs> okay, well, that kind of answers it. <laughs> and you... Now, this is something that might be frowned upon. And I think you've said some friends of yours have maybe said something about it. But you, you put your Blu-rays in sleeves. I do. And you throw out the... Do you keep the cases or throw them out? I throw the case out, but I keep... Uh, I don't know why I even do it, but I keep the little paper insert in the little books, mm -hmm. but I usually put them uh, in storage boxes. Do you put them uh, I, under I, your stairs? Cause I, I put them, I actually have a huge uh, place under my house. It's like, uh, I'm on a, ha on a hill, mm -hmm. so instead of having a narrow crawl space like some houses, I have an enormous, like it could be another couple of rooms down there. So I've got lots of storage space. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, that's sort of an invitation to hoard a lot of crap. <laughs> I know it's sacrilege, and a lot of people, uh, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to own a Blu-ray without all the associated packaging and all that. But uh, I, I just uh, value the space, so I am able to get just these little uh, polypropylene sleeves, just put this thing in, and that's it. So uh, it's a lot easier for me to go flip, 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 and peel one of those out, which is literally no thicker than the disc itself. Mm -hmm. Then for all the other, you know, all the rest of it, where you would need to probably fill your entire room here, yeah, with shelving. Well, I promise I will never let this get in the way of our friendship. <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm very thankful that you took the time to uh, talk with me and our our film junk listeners about your work on the gate. It's oh, like I said, it's a big movie for me. Huh. And I know it's a big movie for a lot of our listeners. So well, thanks. it's been it's great pleasure at my uh, w you know an, an antiquated years to uh, have realized that I sort of fluked into some uh, cult movies. Yeah, you know you don't know it as you're doing it because you don't know how they'll be taken, and uh, you know, it's quite gratifying. And I love the fact that people like the gate. I liked it too. It was mm -hmm. one of the more enjoyable, exhausting but enjoyable jobs because as we worked at it, we felt that. You know the money was going in the bank. You know you didn't feel like, well, this doesn't, this isn't coming together. We felt all along, this is going to be pretty good. You mm -hmm. know, it, it just felt that way, as we would attend the dailies and just the, the, the sense on the set that the kids were good actors and that in its modest way it was it was achieving its goal. So yeah. I'm glad, I'm delighted. You know that, that people enjoy it. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thanks, Craig. Let's say by the minion. Say something, but I. <laughs> <laughs> He'll just rattle at you with his old dentures. <laughs>